when we're on the doorsteps of the festival of Hanukkah, I like to go through the ideas, the themes, the history, the laws, the customs, maybe some insights on to the festival to make it more meaningful, to make us to connect with these powerful eight days that are upcoming in a more deep way. Of course, everyone knows that for the next eight days, we're going to be lighting the candles, we're going to be eating the latkes and the donuts and overeating probably. We're going to be splitting the dreidel. We're going to be thinking about the stories of Hanukkah. And what I wanted to do today is divide the talk into three parts. We're, we're going to begin with the basic history of the story of Hanukkah, the batch story of Hanukkah, some of the laws and things that we do on Hanukkah. And on top of what we did last year, we're going to also talk about some of the customs that are commonly practiced on Hanukkah and maybe go a little bit more advanced on those ideas. What exactly do we do and what are some of the secrets that are captured in this holiday, this eighth holiday of Hanukkah? So, of course, the story of Hanukkah begins with the Greeks and primarily with Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, one of the greatest military minds and leaders of all time. By the time he's 32, he's already dead having captured most of the known world, and included within that the small country of Judea in which the Jews live today called Israel. And for the next several centuries, Israel is going to be under the dominion of the Greeks and the various varieties of the Greeks. And what's very important to stress, and the reason why this period is different than other periods of foreign conquest is that the Greeks did not subsist with merely conquering a nation, making it a vassal state, collecting taxes, and letting them mind their own business. Their ideology, known as Hellenism, that was part of the conquest. It was military conquest and then infusion of Greek ideology, Greek philosophy, Hellenism into the captured land and to create a certain uniform culture throughout the entire vast Greek Empire. And the problem is that although Hellenism and and Greek ideology and Greek philosophy and Greek culture, it does have a lot of overlap with Jewish ideals. You know, previously, we've just met these barbarians. They weren't sophisticated. They weren't intellectual. They weren't interested in ideas. They weren't immersed in philosophy. And that was one kind of villain, one kind of, of enemy that we had to contend with. And then we meet this new kind of enemy, very sophisticated, very advanced intellectually, but on an entirely different vector than, than we're on. You know, we're talking about God. God's the centerpiece of everything we do in Judaism. Our soul, that's what really matters. And we're trying to think about this tension that exists. We've got a body. The body's pulling us towards one world. We have the soul putting us, pulling us to, to, to God, to the other world. And we have Torah that's there to help nudge us in the right direction. That's our philosophy. And we meet a people that on one end is very appealing. In fact, the Torah lauds the Greeks and the beauty within these people. So on one hand, there is a similarity, there's an overlap, but it's taken in the opposite direction. It's not about the soul at all, it's about the body. And it's about the beauty of this world to the exclusion of the next world. And this is going to create tremendous tension that's going to last for hundreds of years when the Greeks are in control and they're trying to push their agenda, they're trying to infuse Judea with Hellenism. And... For the first several hundred years, the Jewish people are not really subject to much forced Hellenism because Alexander dies quickly after he conquers the whole world. There's a story in the Talmud of how he conquered Israel. It's a very dramatic story. He meets the great rabbi and he conquers it bloodlessly. He gets off his horse and he bows down to him. He says, every time I'm about to go into war, I have a dream and this rabbi appears to me. He's my strength. He's my... He's my secret power. He gets off his, his horse and he bows down and, and the conquest is, is totally bloodless. But soon after he dies, and there's of course a very vast empire needs to be divided up, and eventually things are divided up into three. You have the, the Macedonians, you have the Ptolemies, and you have the Seleucids, the Assyrian Greeks. And for the first hundred or so years, you're going to have Judea under the control of the Ptolemyan, the Egyptian Greeks. And about the year 198, 
that is going there's going to be a war and the Seleucid Greeks, the Assyrian Greeks are going to conquer Judea from the Ptolemaean Greeks and that's when things are going to get very difficult for the Jews. Under the Ptolemaean Greeks, of course, there were some Jews that were so enamored, were so enchanted by the Greek ideology, by the Greek beauty, that they became kind of Jewish Hellenists. And these people were Jews, but were trying to merge, to meld the Jewish people together with the beauty of, of, of the Greek ideology. There were some people like that. But the Ptolemyans, they kind of had a live and let live approach for the most part. There was one notable episode about the year 245 before the Common Era where King Ptolemy, they're all called King Ptolemy, I think it was the fourth or the fifth or the third. King Ptolemy, he was really desirous of having a copy of the Torah in his vast library. Again, these are people that are interested in learning and knowledge and wisdom. And of course, the Jewish people, we have the Torah, we have the Pentateuch, we have the five books of Moses that we're obsessed with. And he says, I want a copy, but it's all in Hebrew. So I'm going to commission a group of 70 great sages to write a translation. The reason why he has 70 sages, because he's going to sequester each one of them in their own room so they can collaborate with each other and say, you know what, let's change this, let's change that. And that became known as the Septuagint. The first translation of the Torah was the translation of the 70, where 70 sages translated the Torah into Greek for Ptolemy about the year 245. In fact, in the Jewish calendar, the day that this project was undertaken is considered a fast day. Because when the Gentiles have Torah, it's caused us nothing but heartache. So there was some heartache along the way, but this is incomparable to what's going to happen in the year 198 before the Common Era when the Seleucids are going to take over the land and they're going to begin to militantly enforce and try to promulgate Hellenism in the land. So there's the war, Antiochus III, Antiochus the Great, they soon control over Judah in the year 175. Antiochus IV, he becomes empire, but don't call him Antiochus IV. He's Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Great, Antiochus the God Manifest. He believed that he was divine, and he begins to erect statues of himself in the temples of all the religious people under his rule, and he mandates that they prostrate themselves before him. And he begins this process of forcefully, aggressively promoting the Hellenistic agenda. And then he does things that are totally unconscionable. He begins to meddle in the internal Jewish affairs. So the most important office of spiritual leadership of the Jewish people is the high priest. And that is sacrosanct. That's the one who's going to go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur and going to lobby God to save the Jewish people. And who is selected for that role? The most venerated, the most righteous, the oldest, the greatest sage of the, of the Kohanim. That's the one that was selected. And the Jewish people had a righteous high priest named Chonyo and comes along this new king and says, no, 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 no. I don't want this old Jewish rabbi in charge. He has a brother. His brother's name is Jason. Why is his brother named Jason? Where does that appear in the Tanakh? And it doesn't, of course. He was Hellenized, adopts a Greek name. And Antiochus says, you know what? I'm going to usurp the high priesthood from Chonyo, give it to his Hellenized brother. He's going to help me in building gymnasiums, in establishing all kinds of infrastructure of Hellenism, in the land. He's going to be my political proxy who's going to help me in accelerating this process of forced Hellenization into the land of Judea. And things go from bad to worse. In the year 168 before the Common Era, Antiochus, he intensifies his efforts and he begins to enact decrees, edicts against many core Jewish practices. And he begins this assault on, on Judaism. He says, okay, you keep Shabbos, you're going to be executed. Study Torah publicly, or in a way that if we catch you studying Torah, we're going to execute you. If you observe kosher, if you do circumcision, if you observe the laws of Nida, these are all punishable on pain of death. They would catch a child being circumcised, and they would throw the child 
and the mom off a cliff. And this was the first time in history, it's happened many times subsequently, uh, but the first time in history where circumcision was one of those mitzvos that were banned later on, of course, under Roman rule. Hadrian did the same thing. He too banned circumcision. They would force feed paid to the Jewish people. The brides on the first night of the wedding night, they were fair game for the local chieftain, the local officer, the ruler. They were snatched from their weddings and violated and assaulted by the Greek leader of the place. He even took a uh, Greek god Zeus and installed a uh, an idol in the temple and commissioned sacrifices to it. And of course, this is tremendous defilement of all that is sacred. This is complete sacrilege for the Jewish people, and they're suffering tremendously. And, of course, throughout the land, there's widespread heroism, widespread martyrdom. There are, of course, pockets of people that do embrace the Hellenist, Hellenistic ideology, but the majority are going to stay true to Torah. And we have countless episodes of people being tortured and massacred in tremendously barbaric and painful way because they don't want to capitulate. They don't want to give in to these edicts. You have other groups of people who just flee and they go to the caves and they hide in the mountains. And of course, that's where you get the tradition of the dreidel. They're studying Torah in the mountains and the caves and the Greek officers are doing their inspections to find out what the Jews are doing. And they hear the Greeks coming and they hide the boats and they start playing dreidel. Oh, we're just playing cards. Oh, don't worry about it. We're not doing the prohibited act of studying Torah. There is one famous story that embodies this era of heroism, the story of, of Hannah, of Hannah and her seven sons. There was a woman, Hannah, she had seven sons, and they were brought in front of the, the king, Antiochus, the emperor, and he said, okay, bow down before my God and I'll spare you. And the first one, the oldest son says no, and he's killed. The next one says no, and he's killed. And the next one, the next one, they're all killed, and they all die in martyrdom to maintain their fidelity to God and to not capitulate to the idolatry. In the year 167, so they've been living under this cruel new regime for almost a decade, but really it's been a year since core practice of Judaism have been banned. And in the city of Modi'in, there is a rebellion, a revolt that is launched by an elderly priest named Matthias Matis Yahu. There are various accounts as to how exactly this began. According to one, the Greek soldiers came and they erected an altar. And they said, okay, who wants to offer a sacrifice to the Greek god? We're going to sacrifice a pig. And of course, the Jews said, none of us, we're not interested in that. And one Hellenized Jew says, okay, here I am. I volunteer. And he goes up to the altar and Matisya, when he sees this, that there's a Jew who's going to offer a pig sacrifice to the pagan deity he has a fit of zealotry and rage and he takes the sword that he had hidden under his robes and he goes and he kills the traitor and then he launches himself on the Greeks and they're not prepared, they're surprised and they get pummeled by the masses and they begin this small guerrilla rebellion that initially is almost ignored by the Greeks. You know, a bunch of ragtag Jews against the, you know, the greatest empire in the world, uh, professional soldiers, well-trained, well-armed, well-organized. This is nothing, but really intensifies. And Matasiao, he passes, but he has five sons that they each undertake leadership of this revolt and it grows. And they use unorthodox practices. They engage in guerrilla warfare. They're also crazy. They have these rallying cries. Which is the, the acronym for Maccabi. Who is like you amongst the gods? Our God. Our God's unprecedented. Our God is uh, towering over all the other faux gods. And they just are animals. And they are winning improbable victory after improbable victory. And there's many other episodes that accompany the story. There's one famous episode of Yehudis, Judith. She is not clear who she is. According to one opinion, she was actually the sister of Judah Maccabee and the daughter of of Matasiao. In one version of the story, she is a bride coming to the Greek officer. According to a second version of the story, she is just an old widow and she goes into the Greek camp and she tells him, okay, I, I know the secrets 
of how to overcome this guerrilla army that you're facing. But she plies the Greek officer, one of the Greek generals, with dairy and with wine. She makes him tired. And she takes a sword and cuts off his head and calmly slips his head into her back, walks back out of the camp. And then they take his head and put it on a, on a, on a, on a spike. And the Greeks freak out. Oh, my goodness. Their, their great general is dead and his head is all bloody on the spike. And they get totally get disorganized and they are routed. Now, this war is going to last from the year 167, 25 years. It's going to last into the 140s. But three years after the war commenced, the rebellion commenced, the revolt commenced, there is a certain measure of victory. Many cities have been liberated. Most notably, the city of Jerusalem is now, is now back in the hands of the Jews. And now it's time to come back to the temple and to try to rededicate it and to take all the idols of the Greeks and throw them away and to cleanse all the vessels and to restore the holiness back into the place, back into the holiest place in the world. And they succeeded in recapturing the temple, rededicating it. But the problem was is that the Greeks had shattered all the flasks of oil. Every night, the coin god, the high priest, has to light the oil and they couldn't light it unless they had pure, virgin, unadulterated, uncontaminated oil. And every day there was a flask of oil that they would use that would last for an entire night and, and day to the next day. But the Greeks had shattered the flasks of oil, according to one opinion, is because they thought maybe the Jews were hiding gems, diamonds in it. But the most simple understanding is because the Jewish people would use this for their holy ceremony and they wanted to defile that and therefore they smashed it. But one of the people who was there, at least one version of the story is, they had moved a floor tile and they found, you know, one flask that still had the signet ring of the high priest to show that it was pure and it was supposed to last for only one night. But miraculously, it lasted for eight. And after eight days, there was already a fresh supply of new virgin olive oil. Why did it take eight days to get new virgin olive oil? According to one opinion, because they had to travel to the north, where the the region where they would produce the olives was in the north. So it's a four-day travel there, four-day travel back eight days till you could replenish your oil supply. Alternatively, they were impure, and therefore they needed to go through the purification process before they could engage with anything without conveying defilement to it. Now, as a result of this miraculous victory, and eventually after 25 years, the Maccabees, known as the Hasmoneans, they succeeded in sending the Greeks packing from all of Judea. And that launched the Hasmonean dynasty when the family of Matisiao and his sons and their children, they became the kings of this new dynasty, of this new kingdom, the Maccabean uh, Hasmonean kingdom in Israel. And that lasted a period of Jewish rulership over the land until the Romans came and we know where that went. And since then, we really haven't had, until, until modern times, obviously, we haven't really had any formal or at least extended period of, of Jewish leadership. We did have, of course, brief periods of uh, Bar Kokhba, for example, three years where he did rule the land, but that wasn't – that didn't really last. As a result of this wonderful miracle and especially the miracle of the – of the oil that lasted seven days longer than it was intended to, the sages of Israel established the holiday of Hanukkah to remember the great victory of the Jews over their enemies, but more importantly, to remember and to internalize the preservation of the Jewish religion and the preservation of Torah over the Greeks who wanted to sever the Jewish people from, from their spiritual essence from the Torah. What is ironic about this story, or sad even, maybe tragic, is that, you know, we have a period where the, some Jews become Hellenized. They're aides to the enemy. They're the fifth column. They're trying to integrate as much of Hellenism, as much of Greek ideology into the Jewish people. And then you have this one valiant family that leads the revolt. And they're, of course, the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans. But after things settle down, after the Hasmonean dynasty commences, that same family and those leaders eventually become Hellenized themselves. And that's why their monarchy did not really last. 
that long. It lasted about 100 years until the Romans arrived. Now, it's important to stress that the Hellenists got a bad name and they had to rebrand. They became the Sadducees. So in Jewish philosophy, the Hellenists and the Sadducees are very similar ideologically. They just have a different name because after the Hanukkah story, it became very unpopular to call yourself a Hellenized Jew. But those people still existed and they rebranded themselves as Sadducees, as Tzedokim. When Herod arrived, because Herod fashioned himself as king of Israel, and this is you know sometime 30, 40 years after the fall of the Hasmonean dynasty, he actually assassinated every remnant of his family because he felt that the existence of anyone from, you know, with Hasmonean blood would question his power, his authority as teen, and therefore he assassinated them all, he killed them all. He, he married one of them and killed her too, killed her kids, obviously a lunatic, uh, a barbarian, but he actually totally destroyed that family. In fact, there's a very dramatic story of the last survivor of the Hasmonean family, before he jumps off a roof, he makes this proclamation that anyone who says a part of the Hasmonean dynasty is nothing more than a slave because I'm the last one and I'm about to die. That's a story brought down the Talmud. So a very sad end to this family. Initially, they, they, they veer, of course, spiritually, and eventually they are all killed and the family uh, ceases to exist. That, that line ceases to exist. But they were at the vanguard of the, of the Hanukkah story. And therefore, they are herald, heralded as as such for their role in in this story. I want to read a citation from the Rambam, where he encapsulates this holiday and what happened, the batch story, and what the takeaway is. In the Second Temple, when the Greek kingdom decreed decrees on the Jewish people and tried to nullify their religion, and didn't allow them to study Torah, and to perform mitzvahs, and they extended their hands and their money, and in their daughters, and they entered the sanctuary, and they damaged it, and they defiled the sacred, and it was so difficult, so painful for the Jewish people from them, and the tension, the pain that they had was so severe, until the Almighty, the God of their forefathers, saved them, and they overcame the family Sons of the Hasmoneans, the high priests, they overcame their enemies, they killed them, and they saved the Jewish people from their hands, and they established a king from the Kohan, the Kohanic family, and the monarchy and the hegemony returned to Israel for 200 years until the destruction of the second temple. The Ramam incorporates when the Romans were there, but they nominally had a Jewish puppet king that would be still considered in the Ramam's eyes as a Jewish king even though the Jew didn't really, didn't really, they were defamed of any power. And when the Jewish people overcame their enemies and they destroyed them, that was on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, which is the first day of Hanukkah. And they enter the sanctuary and they did not find any pure oil in the temple, only one vial, one flask. And it had enough oil to last for only one day. But they managed to light eight days worth of candles, until they're able to get new pure oil for the subsequent days. And as a result of that, the sages of that generation decreed that these eight days are that begin on the 25th day of Kislev are going to be days of joy, of celebration, of praise of God, to light the candles every night, every evening at the entrance of your homes for these eight days and to show and to reveal the miracle that the Almighty did for the Jewish people. They're called Hanukkah. And on this day, we can't do eulogies, we cannot fast, like the days of Purim. And this mitzvah is a rabbinic mitzvah, like reading of the Megillah. We know that there's 613 Torah mitzvahs, and there's seven rabbinic mitzvahs. This is one of the seven rabbinic mitzvahs. So why exactly is it called Hanukkah? So there's various different explanations as to why it's called Hanukkah. The word Hanukkah appears in the Torah in the context of the inauguration the initiation or the dedication of the altar, Chanukah Samizbeach. If there's no altar and you want to incorporate a new altar, you have to dedicate it. And you make the days of celebration, eight days of celebration as a result. When the Jewish people came back to the temple, they found that the altar was destroyed and had to rebuild it. Alternatively, the altar was defiled because it was used for idolatrous sacrifices and therefore they had to make a new one, that to commission a new one, and therefore there was just like in the times of the Mishnah, the times of the building of the tabernacle, Moses 
oversaw the eight days of inauguration. Similarly, there's their eight days of Chanukah, of inauguration of the Mizbeach, of the altar. It's interesting, the Midrash actually tells us that after the inauguration of the of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle, we have this celebration where each one of the heads of the tribe brings a gift and various sacrifices in succession. And there's one tribe that's left out, that's the tribe of Levi. And immediately following that in the Torah, so this is the beginning of the book of Numbers, we have the instruction of God telling Moses, go tell Aaron to light the menorah. And Rashi quotes the Midrash to explain that when Aaron saw all these other heads of tribes participating in the inauguration of, of the tabernacle, and he has no, no part in it, he's being comforted, he's being mollified by being told, okay, here, light the menorah. And the Ramban, a very famous time for the Ramban, he says that this is not just referring to the menorah in the temple, in the tabernacle. This is referring to the menorah of Aaron's descendants, the Hasmoneans that are, that are going to descend from Aaron. These people, who are Aaron's descendants, are going to inaugurate the temple a second time, and therefore Aaron's being comforted that you should know that your inauguration, that you're going to do, is greater than this inauguration. These princes, the leaders of the Jewish tribes, they gave very valuable, very precious gifts towards the temple, towards the tabernacle, whereas the dedication of the priests of the Hasmoneans is that much greater because they're going to dedicate their very hearts, their very souls towards the rededication of Hanukkah of the tabernacle. And of course, the central mitzvah of the holiday is to light the menorah. We light the menorah, we make two blessings every night, three blessings on the first night. And the Talmud tells us that there's three tiers of this mitzvah. The basic mitzvah is that every home lights one candle for the whole home. That's the basic fulfillment of the mitzvah. If someone is mehadrin, if they're vigorously and vigilantly pursuing mitzvahs, then you light one candle for each person in the home each night. And if someone is mehadrin, mina mehadrin, if they're the most vigorous of the most vigilant people who want to do mitzvahs in the best possible fashion, well, then it depends. According to the house of Shammai, according to the economy of Shammai, you light eight nights. You light, you light eight candles the first night, and then each night you detract one candle to the fa- final night of Hanukkah, you light one. And of course, no one does that today because we rule like the Academy of Hillel that you start the first night with one candle and you go in ascending order until the final night of Hanukkah, you light eight candles. After you light the candles, there is a custom, a mitzvah to watch the candles and to let them stay lit, says the Talmud, until the last people have left the marketplace, which is about an hour. Now, it's really interesting that there are stringencies that are found in this mitzvah that are not found in any other. So the Ram tells us that the mitzvah of lighting the, the candles of Hanukkah is such a beloved mitzvah and a person has to be so careful to fulfill it properly in order to publicize the miracle and to praise God and to thank him for the miracles they did for us that even if someone has no food to eat and they only eat thanks to the generosity of people who give charity. What they should do is either borrow or sell the shirt on their back to buy oil to fulfill the mitzvah of lighting the Hanukkah candles, which is an amazing thing, that it's such a critical mitzvah, such a beloved and cherished mitzvah, that you even have to sell your clothing to fulfill it. And thankfully, we're not in those dire straits, but it does accentuate for us the power and the precious nature of this mitzvah. When you light the candles... You're not allowed to enjoy for any other mundane purpose that light, which is why we have the shamash. You you light a second light. So that way, if you do end up benefiting from the light, we'll attribute the benefit from the, it came from the shamash, not from the rest of those candles. Once the time has come to light the menorah, we don't do anything. We don't study Torah. We don't eat because now your job is to do this mitzvah of lighting the candles, and you don't want to get distracted with any other pursuits, maybe you'll forget it. In fact, according to some opinions, a half hour before the time to light the menorah, you already cannot do any other work because that may hamper your ability to fulfill this mitzvah properly. 
So I want to talk about some of the other themes that come up on the holiday of Hanukkah. Last year, we spoke about the question as to why we're highlighting the minor miracle, the miracle of the flask of oil, which seems to be a sideshow to the main story, which is the military victory. We talked about that last year. If you want to hear about that, go listen to the podcast from last year. Last year, we also spoke about why we celebrate eight nights when, in fact, the miracle really was only for seven nights. Because after all, there was sufficient oil for one night. There was not sufficient for, for, for eight nights. So the miracle is, is the seven days. And that's maybe the most famous question in all of Jewish literature. In fact, there is a book dedicated to that question and that question alone with 500 answers. This is the most famous question in all of Jewish literature. If the miracle is that one day's worth of oil lasted for eight, well, then it's only seven days of miracle, not eight days. And therefore, why are we celebrating eight days of Celebration. Again, a very interesting question with hundreds of answers. What I want to speak about today is to talk about some of the other themes, some of the other practices, some of the other customs that are commonplace during Hanukkah. We know there is a custom to eat fried food on Hanukkah. And I saw that this year someone published a book on the custom of eating fried foods on Hanukkah. And the famous joke is, you know, why are we celebrating Hanukkah by eating fried foods? The, uh, the real answer is because it's oil and there's miracle happened with the oil. And therefore, it's a way to evoke the miracle by eating oily and fried foods. I had a, 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 a Rebbe, a teacher in, in high school. He used to make a joke. He says that when he was in yeshiva, the chicken that they got was so oily that they would put a witch into it. And they would la- and it would last for eight nights, and it wasn't a miracle. That was that was the joke. It was that oily? But the real joke is that we know the the, the theme of of Hanukkah is to resist the the Greeks, and of course the Greeks they were all about you know the beauty of the human body, and you look at the Greek sculptures, and you have these you know chiseled Greek gods with all their muscles you know perfectly bulging. And a Hanukkah can say, you know what? We're not like that. We're going to have the fattiest foods. We're going to eat donuts. There is no risk of any of us turning into being uh, the handsome chisel Greeks. So when we're fressing latkes and donuts, we know that we're fulfilling our mandate to make sure that we maintain a positive body image, uh, to make sure that we're not uh, at all, God forbid, becoming like the, uh, the Greeks. But we have a custom to spin the dreidel. And it's an interesting custom. Of course, the story is is that they would use the dreidel to mask their Torah study. But we know that every Jewish custom is rooted with deep, powerful, philosophical ideas. So I saw this here. Five different reasons why we spin the dreidel. First idea, very powerful. You spin a dreidel, of course, a dreidel is four-sided. On one is a nun, which stands for nace, miracle. The next one is the gimel, which is a gadol, the large miracle. Haya was sham, there. And then you spin the dreidel, and whichever side it falls on, that's what you get. Either nun, a gimel, hay, or shin. And the game goes that if you get the gimel, you take the whole pot. If you get the shin, then you got to pay a penalty. If you get a hay, then you take half the pot. And if it's a nun, then you it's nothing. It's just uh, you know next guy's turn. But what's interesting, when you spin the dreidel, so it spins very fast, right, on its axis, and you can't really tell... What the letters are. It's all, it's all a blur. You can't really make out the letters on the sides of the dreidel when it's being spun. And only once it rests, only once it's finished spinning, only then could you see the letters that talk about the miracle. And I so saw one of the Hasidic masters says, you know, our life is a blur. You can't really make out the, what's really happening until you, until things settle down, until you have time to reflect. Only then, only after, after things settle down, only then do you see the constant miracles that God does for us. Yes, there are miracles, and there are miracles every day. But because there's such a blur, we can't make it out. And we have to wait for things to relax and to get perspective to be able to, to see it. I have some other interesting ideas to why we spin the dreidel. You know, if you think about it, you don't really have a say in determining which side, which face of the dreidel is going to land uh, after it finishes spinning. And therefore, you really, maybe we should argue we, should, we shouldn't spin. It's, it's not in our hands. 
And we see a model here that it's our job to initiate, to put in our effort, but it's God's job to ensure that the results are okay. You know, just last week in the Parsha, we had Jacob fighting with the angel. And after he finishes fighting and struggling the whole night, he is renamed by the angel Israel. Why is he called Israel? So the angel tells him it's because Kisarisa, because you struggled with the angel and you survived. He doesn't call him victory. The word Yisrael is referring to Sarisa, you struggled, you fought, you put in your effort. The fact that you won, it's almost, it's an afterthought. What matters is you put in the effort. And we have the dreidel. We put in the effort, we spin it, and the results, well, that's in God's hand. Some nice ideas. I saw another, another idea about the dreidel, that you can only claim victory after it falls down. Our life, we think of it as being, you know, this trajectory. We're getting holier, more righteous, more spiritual, more mitzvahs, more Torah. And we think of it naively that it's just this slope that is elevating heavenwards. That's what we think. But we know like a bull market, the general trend is that it's going up. But of course, some days it's down, some days it's up. But the general trend is that it keeps on heading up. And that's the way it is like with with us. That truthfully, you're going to fall. And the only way to claim victory is if you get up after you fall and you keep on fighting. We, have, we spin the dreidel. Only after you've fallen, really, can you win. I want to say another idea, maybe that the dreidel symbolizes the relationship we have with, with God, that God, so to speak, is spinning from the top. Just like you have the dreidel that you only you hold the top when you spin it. The bottom spins, but only because of the top. Similarly, you know, our world, the Almighty is manipulating it. He's spinning it. And we're like the dreidel, but we're being in, we're being overseen by God. He is determining what happens to us. So those are some of the nice ideas I saw about that uh, wonderful custom. Now, it's interesting. The Talmud tells us that we light the Hanukkah candles from when sunset arrives, when darkness descends, until the passerby abandon the marketplace. Of course, once it gets dark, people start going home. And the marketplace empties out. So the time is from the beginning when it starts to get dark, sunset. There's still a little bit of light that you can still see. Even after sunset, you can still see a little bit. But then it gets very dark and everyone goes home. All the people, all the passerby from the marketplace, they all go home. So the commentators have told us that one of the messages of, of the menorah is that you light it from when it gets dark. When there's darkness, when there's danger, when there's uncertainty, when there's difficulty, when you're not so sure what's happening to you in your lives, you light that Hanukkah candle and you remember that the Almighty runs the show. And you do that until the marketplace is abandoned, is empty. You know, the mar- what's the marketplace? It's people saying, my effort is going to determine my success. I'm going to go to the market, get there early, work really hard, become very rich. But... In that way of life, where's God? Where's God's pay? Where's God's role? Of course, you have to put in your effort. You got to go to the marketplace, but you have to also realize that ultimately it's God who determines what happens to you, and therefore you're trying to infuse faith and reliance on God on Hanukkah until the no some of the notions of the marketplace are abandoned until. The idea of God actually running the show, actually determining what happens to you, that takes root in your heart and a little bit of the notion of your work contributes towards your result until that is a little bit removed from your heart. There is a prayer that we say every day of Hanukkah during the prayers and during the after meal blessings called Al Hanisim, which is Al Hanisim on the miracles and on the wonder things, wonderful, wonderful things that God does. We start listening to the whole story of of Hanukkah, and we thank God for that. But one of the things that we thank God for is al hamilchamos on the wars. We're thanking God for the wars. And the obvious question is, should we be thanking God for the victory? Why are we thanking God for the wars? Interesting question. So the commentators give us an answer that this is a spiritual war. Spiritual wars are different than physical wars. We think of the war in military terms, well, that war is over. But the spiritual war that we're engaging with the ideals of Greek ideology is still ongoing. 
and we're thankful to God that we're still in the war. We're still in the fight. We haven't lost yet. Where are the Hellenists? Where are the ancient Greeks? They're all gone. They've all been transitioned to the dustbin of history. We're still here, and we're still fighting, and therefore we're thanking God for giving us the strength, the wherewithal to still be in the fight. And of course, the destiny of the Jewish people, the idea of Messiah, is the final triumph, but we're still in that war. I want to conclude with a story that I heard, a wild story. I read it this year. It tells of a gentleman who went through the atrocities of the Holocaust, lost his family in the Holocaust, and as a result of that, you know, had a very difficult time forgiving God, if you will, for what happened to him. So he, you know, after the war, he moved to the United States and he abandoned his religion, essentially. He abandoned his Jewish identity and he went to live in a place that had very few Jews and he married. His wife was also someone who had abandoned her Judaism and they started raising a family outside of the infrastructure of of Jewish life. When their eldest son was almost 13... His father wanted to tell him, you know, we're Jewish, and therefore the 13th birthday is a special birthday. I'm going to take you to the city, and we're going to go buy you a gift, because after all, you know, now you became part of the Jewish people. We don't celebrate, we're not practicing, we're not observant, but still, it's a special birthday, I want to buy you whatever you want. Let's go to the city. So they go to the city, and the son says, I want to go to that store. I want to go to that store. It's a Judaica store. The father's like, oh my goodness, this does not sound good. He's going to be drawn to Judaism. This is terrible. But you know what? Okay, we'll see what they have in the store. So they get to the store, and the son fixates on a hand-carved menorah. He really wants to buy that menorah. The father says, no, 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 there's other stuff. Let's get some something else. He doesn't want him to have a menorah. What's going to be? And... The son is insistent. I want to buy this menorah. So the father has no choice. He promises he's going to buy whatever he wants. And he goes to the shopkeeper and says to him, how much for this piece? How much for this menorah? And the shopkeeper tells him, I'm sorry, this menorah is not for sale. This is my personal menorah. I spent a lot of money in it. It was hand-carved by a man in the concentration camps. It's one of a kind. I'm not parting from this menorah. So the father tells him, I'm sorry, we have to pay something else. He says, no, insisting, you say you'll buy me anything I want. I want this menorah. Buy it from him. So the man says, I know you don't want to sell it, but there's a price for everything. I know you paid a lot of money for it. I'll give you, you know, a profit margin off it. And finally, they agree on an exorbitant price and the father buys the son this hand-carved menorah. They bring it home and the son is entranced by this menorah. Every day he gets home from school and wants to play with it, waiting for Hanukkah. He knows that Hanukkah is upcoming. He's going to light on Hanukkah. Every day he gets home and he's just obsessed with this menorah. And the first night of Hanukkah, he takes down the menorah and he's so excited he's going to light it. And in his joy, in his ecstasy, he loses it and it falls on his, from his floor and it shatters into a million pieces. And the kid is devastated, heartbroken that he lost his menorah. And father sees him, try, father tries to comfort him. He says, okay, we're going we're gonna to rebuild it together. Let's build it together. And as they start putting the pieces together, they discover in one of the, in one of the branches, there was a hollowed out part of the menorah and a small little piece of paper comes out of the menorah. And the father opens the paper, and it's written in Yiddish. And he reads it, and he faints. And after he's revived, he tells the story. He says, you know what this letter says? This letter is written by the, the, the builder of this menorah. And he's writing that he's working 14 hours a day in the concentration camps for the Nazis. And every night, he sneaks some few minutes to work on this menorah. And he's hoping 
that he's going to be alive in a few months it's going to be Hanukkah. And he cannot wait to light this menorah. But he knows that the fact that he's going to survive to Hanukkah is not assured. He may die. And therefore he's requesting whoever finds this menorah, whoever gets this menorah, please light this menorah in the merit of my soul. And he signs his name and his name is none other than the father of the father of this permissive boy. His grandfather actually carved this menorah. And he's writing in it, hoping that someone will light this menorah, will light this candle in the merit of his soul. Apparently, this is a true story. And of course, the father's all shaken up, the kid's all shaken up. And there's, obviously, it's a miracle that the kid's being drawn to to this particular menorah, and through this fortuitous accident, they discover this amazing story that the grandfather of this child, the father of the father of the Mermitsa boy, actually was the same one who did it. And this family, once again, reconnected to their roots. Once again, reconnected. Of course, that Hanukkah must have been a very emotional Hanukkah for them. But this story and the dedication, the self-sacrifice of the grandfather, where he made this menorah, under the most treacherous conditions known to humanity, this eventually found its way to his family and brought them back into the fold. And maybe that's symbolic of the of the of the story of Hanukkah. The story of Hanukkah is, you know, there's this tension. We're a nation. We have a dream. We have a destiny. There's a roadmap that we have to take. But of course, we tend to veer off the track every once in a while. Sometimes this direction. Sometimes that direction. During the times of the Hanukkah story, it was towards Hellenism. There was also the forced desecration of our religion. And every every time in history, every era in history, there's a different challenge. And the idea of Hanukkah is to tap into that inner light that we have within us, the inner Jew that we have within us, that that flame, that spark of what makes us special that cannot be extinguished. That's symbolized with this lighting of, 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 of the menorah. And the hope is that we all have a wonderful, happy, and healthy, and meaningful Hanukkah we light those candles and we dwell upon what they show us, not what they show us about necessarily the past, what they show us about the present and what they are able to unearth, what we're able to unearth from within us, that true spark, that true fire, that true joy of being a Jew and being proud of it, to take this lesson of Hanukkah and to inspire ourselves, inspire our family, inspire the passerby, bring light into the world of darkness Remember why we're here. Remember why we're special. May we all merit a wonderful, happy, healthy Hanukkah. Chag Sameach.